We can we talk, for example, about um, people with Down syndrome. There are probably more people alive with Down syndrome today than ever before in human culture because when a baby was born with the obvious signs of that disability, that baby was more often than not exposed or smothered. Anthropologists can tell us that that kind of variation was not permitted to live in other societies. So human societies have always tried to standardize. That's what culture is. That's what socialization is. To make a boy behave like a boy and a girl behave like a girl and that there's no middle ground. There are feminine ways to sit in the world and there are male ways to sit in the world as far as cultures were concerned. And much of the gay, lesbian, transgender movements of today is to encourage more variability. Uh, we will always have the deaf with us. We will always have the blind with us because deafness and blindness are not just genetic conditions. Brain damage is not just a genetic condition. Life does this to people. I don't see that, that this um, disability rights movement um, is, well, well let, let me start, start that sentence again. I don't, I don't think, think the enemy of disability rights is the people who practice prenatal diagnosis and um, termination of pregnancies with afflicted fetuses. I think there are way more important enemies out there that would be much better for those of us who appreciate variability in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our families. Uh, there are much more important things to look at than that. Um, I don't want to suggest for a minute that um, the perspective that I'm putting forward um, is understanding uh, anyone as the enemy. Uh, I think that it's important to make uh, points about the valuing and devaluing of disability as a human condition. I think that um, if we have a medical mandate to try to eliminate disability and disease from the world, there are several consequences of that that we want to think through. Uh, one of them is the human variation. Well, before we think it through, before we think it through, I apologize for interrupting you, but I don't see a medical mandate to do that any place. So um, I, I want to ask first, where is the medical mandate? Okay. Let me, go on to another, let me go on to another point that I'd like to make, and that is that um, if we understand disability as that which we don't want in shaping human populations, I think that the problem that it presents several problems, but one other problem that it presents is that it gives a message to the world that disability is that which can be avoided. And in fact, disability is inherent in the human condition so that, and this is quite often said, that if we live long enough, we'll all become disabled. And so the initiative to eliminate disability in that sense uh, becomes um, a rather futile undertaking. What I think can be suggested is that accommodating disability, providing services, for example, for uh, disabled children that are born into the world or people who become disabled, to put our time and energy and resources into that might be a better way to think about the human variations that we think of as disability 
than attempting to create um, a variety of procedures that will eliminate disability. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, except that uh, I don't see that the two things are in our society today incompatible to pursue at the same time. Um, there are enormous ways in which the medical community understood large in its largest sense um, has always been in favor of enhancing the life of those who are disabled or those who are ill. That's what medicine is. So if a, um, a physician and a physicist working together came up with, and this is in fact what happened, uh, came up with the device, the cochlear implant, for enabling certain deaf individuals to hear. This is not an effort to eliminate deafness in the whole community. It's an effort to ameliorate a problem that some people would like to have ameliorated. Nobody is forcing. There's there's no effort to force every child, every deaf child, to have a cochlear implant. But the, to offer it to those people who want it and who are lucky enough to live in a circumstance in which they can afford to do it, um, what's wrong with that? That's what medicine is. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, I'm not arguing against the idea of choice. I'm uh, simply suggesting that if we normalize all people, and if our goal is to normalize people, then we stand a chance of losing some forms of variation that can offer things to the world. You're absolutely right, but I'd like to know who it is that you feel in that we, uh, which is a global we. Who it is who is making an effort to normalize the population? I'm not prepared to point fingers or say who. I'd like to bring up another question, though, and that is the issue of um, predict. I mentioned quality of life as an issue and potential contributions, and I think one of the most important questions around the issue of prenatal diagnosis is that it assumes a couple of things. One of the things that it assumes is that suffering is that which can be predicted, that which can be avoided, and that which is associated with disability um, in all cases. Uh, and. I think that's an important question to ask uh, for several reasons. First of all, because, of course, disability, as I mentioned, is part of the human condition. And most disabilities uh, are acquired, of course, after birth. Um, and also, the presence of a disability does not necessarily suggest that suffering will follow or that life is burdensome. Um, as a result of a disability. In fact, many people with disabilities, as you know, and I think everyone recognizes, um, are quite compatible with flourishing and making contributions that are important. Um, there are two Coming, coming through? Not too much on this end. Okay, okay so, so we can continue with the Okay. Let's give it a try. Uh, in the in practice of prenatal, di di prenatal diagnosis, there are three individuals, or three groups of individuals. One are the parents, the other are the physicians, and the other health care professionals. And then there is the individual the fetus in the case of prenatal diagnosis. And whether or not we refer to the fetus as an individual is a very important and um, 
in policy terms crucial, but for the moment I'm just going to refer to them that way because otherwise my sentences will be, get very awkward. So the question is who's suffering is the uh, practice of prenatal diagnosis meant to abate? It's not the suffering of the physician. So we're talking about the individual who will be born with that disability and we're talking about the parents.